Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. I will be reading it out of the NIV. When you have it, say amen. amen. Then he showed me, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. Hmm. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this a man? Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Remember that, is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. And generally when you see the angel is some theophonic reference to God. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, oh, I have taken away your sin. Oh. So why are you still walking in guilt? See, I have taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and closed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and to keep my requirements, then you will govern my house. Hmm. If you obey me, I'll make you the boss. Then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. Whoo! Your gift will get you there, but your obedience will keep you there. We are so focused on gifts, and we want to be in the room where it happens. Well, once you get in the room, how do you stay in the room? This, this, there's so much in this text, I don't even know what to do with it. <laughs> I got pages of notes, and then I got stuff in my head, and it's just driving me crazy because God keeps talking to me out of this text. This text is so powerful. I'm going to try to focus my attention on the assignment he gave me in the B clause of the second verse. Look at that. The Lord said to Satan, that's A clause, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, the Lord who have chosen Jerusalem rebuke you, that's A, I want B. Is not this man a burning stick snatched? Somebody holler, snatched. snatched. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire. My subject this morning is snatched. Let's pray. Some of us, Lord, are leisurely developing, but some of us sense the urgency of this present moment. There is an urgency, sometimes externally. There is an urgency, sometimes internally. There is a point that we sense because we are spiritual beings that if we don't move now, we're going to miss it. As we go into the Word of God today, speak to us out of the volume of the book, O oh God. Feed us till we want no more. 
Feed us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Relax, kick your shoes off. I would take your stockings off, but y'all don't wear them no more. <laughs> I'm a big believer in process because God processed me. And it took me a long time. God spent 20 years of my life in the hills of West Virginia just working some of the kinks out. Not that I don't have any left, but you should have seen me when he started. And I teach process because most people teach promise. And it's touted over our pulpit about promise and people get excited about promise. And if I want to get uh, uproar in the church, just start talking about the promises of God and everybody starts shouting. But the truth of the matter is, especially in this generation where you are inundated with so much instant stuff, things we had to work for, travel for, go to get, walk to get, catch the bus to get, finally got a car to go get, you can snap a button and they'll bring it to you. And so it's natural, this is not a criticism, it's an observation, it's natural that you would think that the things of God work that way, that you can, you can just Uber it, that you can just click a button and it happens. And that creates a depression because you think you're behind when in fact you are not behind. Real greatness takes time. It takes time. It really does take time. And you say, no, uh, Tupac got it quick, so-and-so got it quick, this one got it quick, he did, but you get my point. And you, you, the, the people that are advertised to you are not the rule, they're the exception to the rule. There aren't gonna be but so many people that make it in the NFL. There aren't gonna be, you, you'd be, if I had every guy in here who was practicing to be a rapper stand, it would fill the choir stand twice. <laughs> he all in the mirror with the hairbrush. <laughs> you can't take that time. Got demo tapes everywhere. No job, no car, no transportation, but demo tapes everywhere. And it's not your fault. You're not doulas, you're not lazy. You're responding to what's been modeled in front of you. And you don't understand that you're following the exception, not the rule. You're following the minority, not the majority. The likelihood of you making it in this industry, in the industry that you are after, may be very difficult. You need a backup plan, but you don't want to take a backup plan because that requires process, classes, learning, training, information, and you think you're gonna beat the odds never noticing that you've lost an entire decade trying to beat the odds. And so by the time you beat the odds, even if you do beat the odds, you've lost 10 years trying to beat the odds. And you're probably not gonna beat them. It's an important message then for me to talk about process. It's important that we understand as it relates to our goals, whether they're personal life goals or whether it's spiritual growth, time matters. I just got through feeling the pulse to tell you time matters. Experience and exposure often take time. I asked the Lord, I said, God, you got a sense of humor. The doors you're opening up for me, why didn't you open them up for me when I was 30? You know, for my, for my knees hurt. <laughs> and knees will make you know what time it is. I carry a watch, but I don't need one because I got steps. And steps tell me. I, I watched Pastor Michael running up and down them steps. I could have hit him in the head with my Bible because he don't even know that that won't last long. <laughs> in a few minutes, you'll be going down them steps like. I like the steps going to bite me. <laughs> you have to understand that, that 
that even though I thought that I knew when it ought to be, God knew when I was ready for it. And God does everything in its own time and in its own season. And even education doesn't negate experience. As important as it is to receive professional education and training, and I love it and I believe in it, nothing prepares you like actually doing the work. You can have a D-man, a D-D, a D-A, a D-C, a D-B, but until you get up here and you start pastoring people, until you sit in front of people who got problems for which there's nothing in the manual to respond to, until you find the challenge of trying to build buildings, negotiate with banks, solve problems, have insurance, deal with lawsuits, and preach the gospel, you're not even beginning to understand the dynamics of what it costs to be a leader until you've had a crisis in your family and still had to preach the gospel anyway, you don't understand. They don't teach you anything in school about the drama in your house while you're encouraging somebody in their house, but that's the reality of it all. Come on, somebody. You, that, that takes time to develop that. And you will understand that further down in the text, we see that, that sanctification is a matter of process. So this text does have process in it, Joshua is in a place of true sanctification. True sanctification. It is that effort and process that makes us value the accomplishments that sanctification brings. If it came easy, you wouldn't appreciate it. My wife and I have been married 42 years. I, amen. I was going to say, almost everything that could happen has happened, but I'm scared. <laughs> there might be some things left. So a lot has happened in 42 years, other than the pictures we put on Instagram. We didn't put the pictures on Instagram of the hard times. So if you're getting all your education by post, you have a false expectation of what reality is like. You, you have to go through things that are difficult so you appreciate them, so you value them, so you hold on to them. When things take time and you go through tests and you go through trials, the glue that holds you together isn't just romanticism. It isn't just about 36, 24, 36 and fat lips. When did fat lips become such a thing that people get needles in their mouth? I saw a lady the other day, her lips was big as a, a plate of chitlins. It covered up her whole head. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> But, but th things take time in order to bring them to fruition. Process, somebody shout process. process. It is important that you understand that process is important, and yet you have to realize it is that effort and process that creates praise, that brings sanctification, that purifies our hearts that puts us in a place of humility and gratitude. Because if it's easily given, it's easily tossed aside. I often use this illustration. You see people go to preach and they're preaching with great power and the anointing comes and people start running up there and throwing money on the altar. Look at the money. It's never big money. You never toss $5,000, $10,000, $100,000 on the altar. You'd, give, you'd throw five, 10, 20, maybe even 100. But big stuff is never tossed. And I'm not, I'm not despising the five to 10. I'm not playing on you. I'm not hating on you. Because sometimes you're just throwing it down and say, ain't that the truth? I get it. 
But the reality is when you get ready to really make a sacrifice, it requires deliberation, it requires submission, it requires contemplation, and you handle it different because it costs you more to get it. Come on, somebody. Every now and then they say, I want to put this in the bishop's hand. It's never a dollar. It's when it costs you more to get it, you don't let go of it easily. The problem in life is to figure out when am I, when am I in process and when am I in crisis that requires a speedy, immediately, suddenly move from God. We see it all over the Bible. There were certain things that were processed. There were other things that were instantaneously. Yes, sir. And the Bible said he snatched him out. The children of Israel walked out. They walked for miles. They walked across the desert. They walked through battle. They walked through drought. They walked through isolation. They walked through famine. He had to send birds in the air to feed them, and he let them walk for 40 years. He did not snatch them out. He did not snatch them out. And there are certain things in your life, and if you take all of our messages and put them up against each other, they look contradictory because you're looking for an absolute truth. But absolute truth is like going to a pharmacy asking them for one prescription. It depends on the condition, what message you need. Does that make sense to you? So for the person that's walking through a process that God is not snatching them out, if you come next Sunday, I got something for you. If you come next week, I got something for you. You come in a month, I got something for you. There are other times that things are so critical and so crisis-oriented that you don't have time to worry about being nice. You got to snatch them out. You got you to snatch them out. I'm, a, I'm learning about this stuff they call soft parenting, and it has pros and cons. Sometimes you can be soft. Gentle, gentle, is that what it is? See, I can't even say it. Because <laughs> there wasn't nothing gentle in my house. <laughs> Except oatmeal. Everything else was, you know. Anyway, sometimes you, 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 you sometimes, I don't have time to say, Johnny, now you know better than this. Let's sit down and think this over and the consequences that will result from the actions you're going through. And talk to me, Johnny. Now, how are you, how are you feeling at this moment? Do you feel good about yourself? Do you feel good about what you're going through? Do you see mommy and daddy acting like this? Now, really, Johnny, come on here. There are times you should do that. There are times I should have done more of that. I get that. But there are other times. <laughs> I won't illustrate. But there are other times. There are times for you to, to, to minister in such a way that's ingratiating, that's comforting, that's encouraging, that's uplifting, that moves you. There, there are other times you need to say, if you don't stop, you're going to hell. If you don't change your ways, you're going to wreck your marriage. If you don't stop yelling, you're going to lose that boy. If you don't so and so and so, do you hear the words that are coming out of my mouth? Snatch. Somebody holler, snatch. snatch. Read Jude 121 through 23. I'm going to drive this home. And keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously and looking forward to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, which will bring you to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. So there are some people that are doubting that Jude says you should have mercy upon. 
You should just have mercy. They doubt, they don't believe, they, they, they're atheists, they're agnostic, they joined another religion, and they come to the family reunion, and they, they burn in sage in your backyard, you know, and they weird, and they got all kinds of signs on their head and stuff, and tattoos on their light leg and st stuff like that, and they steal your cousin, and, 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 and some, 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 not at my house, but some, you can burn it at your house, but, but, but I know you burn it, but I'm still gonna feed you. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. So you can't handle every case the same way, not in your house, not in your ministry, not in your preaching, not in your church. There's times to be gracious and kind and comforting. There's times to look the other way because you know the person hadn't developed in that area and you don't put them out the church because they got a problem. There are times you have to have the sensitivity to know when to, to endure some things and have mercy on them. Other times you got to snatch them out of the fire because if you don't snatch them, you're going to bury them. If you don't snatch them, you're going to lose them. If you don't snatch them, they're going to commit suicide. Side. If you don't snatch them, they're going to lose their mind. Somebody say snatch. snatch. Of some make a difference. Others say with fear, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy, but with fear, loathing even the clothing spotted and polluted by their shameless immoral freedom. Having, having patience with them is not giving permission to them because you know that what they are doing, wearing, acting out is loathsome because it's loathsome to God. Not because it's loathsome to you. If it's loathsome to you, you're in your flesh. You're in your flesh. How can you tolerate your sin and condemn mine? So, so I'm no more loathsome than you are. So, so you, anytime you start operating in your flesh, sometimes we have judgment on people about their sins because it's not what we do. But we have mercy on our sins because we are relating to our own experience. See, I can't have a God like that. That's why I can't let you be God. The, David said, I'd rather fall into the hands of God than fall in the hands of man because man is prejudiced. Man is biased. Man has a point of view. Man has a perspective. Throw me in the hands of God. At least it's going to be fair. Whatever happens is going to be fair. You're going to judge me and kill me to cover up your mess because sometimes killing me makes you feel better about you. But when you are in sin and God hates sin, I cannot love what God hates and then hate what God loves. I, you have to understand that I have to reflect the mind of God. And when it comes to certain things, God said you got to snatch them out of the fire. It often appears as a double standard. I know it, it's hard to, to understand. It's a spiritually discerned thing, which time is which, even for me. Sometimes I get it right, sometimes I get it wrong. But it's spiritually discernment when to do one thing and when to do the other, to understand in that moment what to do. Now, when you're looking at it later on Facebook, you can have an opinion, but in that moment, you got a split second to make a decision how to handle this situation. Are they screaming because they lost their mother? Are they screaming because they lost their mind? Are they screaming because they're possessed with the devil? Are they screaming because they're getting ready to kill half of the church? Are they screaming? You got a second to make a decision. If you get it wrong, somebody's going to die. There are people with whom God exercises more patience. Raise your hand if he's been patient with you. He's extended mercy towards you, allowed you to gradually evolve. 
It's the mercy of the Lord. But others, Jude says, require an urgency. There comes a point that you cannot expect God to continually to be patient about your weaknesses, your, your peculiarities, your idiosyncrasies, and your sin. Shall we continue in sin, Romans 6 said, that grace may abound? God forbid. How can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I'm talking about a lifestyle. I'm talking about laying in and I'm talking about wallowing in the mud like a pig and you don't want to get out. Still coming to church, singing in the choir, still ushering, still deaconing, still doing whatever you want to do. Your Sunday face don't look nothing like your Friday night face. They're two different things and God has winked at it in times past. But there comes a point that God stops winking and he doesn't always announce when he's going to stop winking. There comes a point that God gets tired of you acting like you can walk when you know you can walk, when you act like you can't get over it, when you know you can get over it. And you've got all of these therapeutic words that give you permission to stop getting better. But there's going to be a time out moment where God says enough is enough and he's going to snatch you. He's going to snatch you. He's going to snatch you. They must be snatched out of the fire. He's not snatching you because he hates you. He's snatching you because you put yourself in an environment that's going to get you killed. He's snatching you because you put yourself in an environment that's going to cause you to die. He's snatching you because you put yourself in a place that you're going to get destroyed. He's snatching you because you're in love with a killer. He's snatching you because you went to bed with a murderer. He's snatching you because you're on fire. You don't even know it, but you're on fire. You're playing with fire. My mother said hot things will burn you. You're playing with fire and you wouldn't listen at nobody. You wouldn't respond to nobody. You're hard-headed and stubborn and the therapist can put a better name to it, but your head is hard as a rock. And sometimes God has to snatch your attention and that's why you're in the hospital. And that's why you're going through a test because sometimes God has to slow you down because once you get your roll on, you won't listen at nobody. And God says, sometimes I got to snatch you out of the fire, hating even the garment that was spotted by the flesh the sin, the carnality, the lust, the adultery. You're sitting in the room and your lover's in the room and you got a boyfriend in the back and you're sitting by your husband. And God said, I got to deal with it. I got to deal with it. I got to deal with it. You, you're a deacon, but you're a player. You're a deacon, but you're a player. You got your game on. You're sitting up there trying to look cool, trying to look hot, trying to look sexy. You come in the church and work the church like you were in a strip club because you have no respect for the house of God. And God said, I got to snatch you out of the fire because pretty soon you're going to destroy yourself. You're going to implode yourself. You're going to end up in a place that you can't get out of. Look at somebody I say enough is enough. I'm going to snatch you out. I'm going to snatch you out. It won't be graceful, but you got to get out. Jude says some people you have to snatch out. You got to give them an ultimatum. Sooner or later it comes to a point that you got to say, wait a minute, enough is enough. This isn't getting any better. It's not going to change. If you're going down, I'm not going with you. If you burn up, you burn by yourself. I'm not going down with you. You got to snatch them out of the fire. Glory to God. Shake somebody by the head and say, this is a snatch Sunday. It is a Sunday of radical change. It is a Sunday of a revolution. It is a Sunday of a breakthrough. It is a Sunday that God's going to do something speedily. It's a Sunday where you're going to make three days journey in one. It's a Sunday that's going to pull you out. It's a Sunday that's going to stop the burning in your life. It's a breakthrough that God wants to give you. I want somebody to give him 30 seconds of praise for a snack. Sister Tanya, I won't even lie. There's been some times he had to snatch me. He had to snatch me out. I cried, but he had to snatch me. 
I, I was hurt, but he had to snatch me. My heart was broken, but he had to snatch me. He ended some things. He cut some things off that broke my heart, but he had to snatch me. I'm happy now, but I wasn't happy at the time because nobody enjoys being snatched. But my mama used to say, I'll snatch a knot in you. Every now and then you got to snatch them out of the fire. Do you hear what I'm saying? Other areas he allowed me to mature gradually, refining me like a fine and exotic wine. It's his decision to make. That same God has occasionally demanded an immediate response. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but God said he is demanding an immediate response. He has demanded a sudden, pivotal reaction. He has demanded a quick move that didn't allow me to gradually leave Egypt. I had to leave overnight. I didn't have time to bring my couch. I had to pack up the essentials because it's going to be a Passover. God said to me, I don't know who this is for, but this Sunday is a Passover. You're going to, you're going to leave overnight. You don't have time to bring your couch and your refrigerator and your ice box and your coffee table. You got to pack for the journey. You got to leave this time tomorrow. You're going to be in a new place. This time tomorrow, you're going to be in a new state. This time tomorrow, Tomorrow, Pharaoh's going to be behind you. This time tomorrow, there's going to be a revolution. There's going to be a metamorphosis. There's going to be a sudden change. There's going to be a resurrection. It's going to be quick, fast, and in a hurry. Your friends are not going to believe it. They're going to laugh and say you're a phony, but God is getting ready to snatch you out of the fire. Throw your hands up and say, snatch me, Jesus. The Bible said, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Stop playing hard to get. Stop telling me later. Stop telling me tomorrow. Stop telling me as soon as you come back from the cruise. No, God said, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Imagine if the woman with the issue of blood had waited she would have missed her healing. And what would have become a blind Bartimaeus had he not sensed the urgency of this final opportunity to cry out to God? Every now and then, you got to get radical. If you don't get out right then, you're not going to get out. Blind Bartimaeus stopped him on the way to the cross. If he hadn't have shouted, he would have missed every opportunity that would have brought about a healing in his life. Sometimes you got to know when you're running out of time and God has to snap you out of the fire. Glory to God, I feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost coming in this place. There will be a breakthrough this morning. There will be deliverance this morning. There will be a move of God this morning. Somebody give him a praise right where you are. I'm sick of my sin. I'm sick of myself. I'm sick of being evil. I'm sick of, I'm sick of being manipulative. I'm sick of being a con artist. I'm sick of not feeling good about myself. I want to be a better person. He that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. Until you want better, you won't be better. Until you hunger after it, until you thirst after it. It didn't say he that is righteous. It said he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. Somebody holler, I'm hungry. That's who God is looking for. People who are hungry to be better. Not people who are making excuses to wallow in their own filth. God wants somebody who's hungry. God wants somebody who lays down at night and feels sorry and say, God, I hate that I acted like that. I hate that I do people like that. I hate that I have that attitude. I hate that I walk in that lust. I hate that I'm tied in bondage. I hate that I'm running around on drugs. I hate that I'm an addict. I hate that I'm hateful. I hate that I beat my wife. I hate that I beat my children. I hate that I'm abusive. I hate that I use my tongue to praise you and then turn around and use my tongue to curse the people I love and I need to be snatched out because I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and I want to break through. I feel an anointing about to take this place. Somebody clap your hands. I feel a breakthrough in this with holiness, holiness unto the Lord, holiness, holiness unto the Lord, holiness.
Sit down, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm about to sit on my text. Hey! I'm gonna sit on it till I hatch it. I'm gonna sit on it till it gives birth. I'm gonna sit on it till it gets a breakthrough. Let us be clear, my brothers and sisters, this is not the Joshua who marched around the walls. This is not Joshua, the son of Nun. No, 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 no. This is a completely different Joshua. He is the son of Jehozadak. He is not the son of Nun. He comes thousands of years later. He comes after Israel has been in exile, after they have been in Babylonian captivity. He comes at a particular and unique time in history where they have been with heathens for years. Come, sir. Come, sir. And when he comes back to Jerusalem, it is not the Jerusalem that he remembers. You remember when they left, they said, if I could get Jerusalem, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. But when they got back, it did not look like the Jerusalem they remembered. Have you ever gone to your high school reunion? <laughs> and what you remembered, and somebody walks up, hey, uh, I'm Philip. And if it wasn't for them eyes, you wouldn't even know who they were, and you had to stand and look at them a few minutes. When they got back to Jerusalem, there was no smell of bread baking. The cobbler's building had been torn down. The cobblestone streets of Jerusalem had been hacked and full of holes. The temple had been shattered to pieces. The epitome of their religious conviction had been completely annihilated. The place where Shekinah glory had sat down had been disrupted. All of their memories, their culture, their food, their, their, the, the landscape of their ideas had been completely rearranged. That's why it's not safe to live in your head. Be because in your head, you can imagine things to be a way that they really were not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In death, everybody was a hero. And everybody remembers all the good stuff. But, but, but when they came back, it wasn't all good. It was a mess. It was, it was the ruins of Jerusalem. The text occurs after the exile has ended. Jerusalem has greatly declined, a mere shadow of what it once was. They have come to a point that they return, what they return to in no way resembles what they left or even what they had in mind. It almost looks like a community after a tornado has hit it. I'm on the right street, but it doesn't look like it. I'm not really certain, but I think I used to live over there. Fragments and debris has filled the streets. Everything that would remind them of home has been completely annihilated. They have to clear back the rubbish that is left behind and try to rebuild the fragments of what used to be. It is a disaster area. Yet God is worthy to be praised. Come on with me. Although, although I admit Jerusalem is a mess, it's in ruins, it's been desecrated, it's almost destroyed. It is still far better than to have stayed in captivity. 
You see, Joshua's dad, Jehozadak, was murdered by Nebuchadnezzar. And had he stayed where he was, he was next. When you know that you were next to be destroyed, you will stop complaining about what the church isn't, what the saints didn't do, who didn't speak to you when you came in the lobby. All of those are luxury items for people who have not been snatched. When you've been snatched out of fire, you don't care what seat you sit in. You don't care whether they put you on the front row or the back row. When you've been snatched out of the fire, you don't care what, how nobody looks at you. You don't care what nobody says to you because you've been through a hell so bad behind you that you say, this is better than that. When you really get saved, you can come into an environment. The church don't have to be perfect, but it's better than the crack house. The church don't have to be perfect, but ain't nobody hitting me in the head with a bat anymore. The church don't have to be perfect. You think rolling your eyes at me is going to run me out of here? Honey, I've been hit in the head with a bat. This is better than that. Somebody shout, this is better than that. When you've been through hell and you come back, you praise God over stuff that other people complain about. You don't care about what parking space you get in. You're just glad to be saved, glad to be washed in the blood, glad to be a child of the king. Turn me up in this mic. Glad to give God the glory. You don't understand. The church folk don't understand your praise because they sit up there with their cute self five generations of Holy Ghost field people. But when you were the wino and a whoremonger, when you were the dope dealer, when you was HIV positive, when you saw all your friends die of AIDS, you don't have time to be worried about no foolishness fooling with these church folk. You got a God to be praised. Is there anybody in the church today? Hallelujah. You used to be captive. You used to be in exile. You used to didn't have freedom. And you're glad for the glorious liberty that you have down in your soul. And even if the singers can't sing, you'll still shout. Because it's not their riff that's making you shout. It's how God brought you out of bondage. It's how God delivered you. It's how God set you free. It's how God opened doors for you. Is there anybody left in the church that's just grateful to be a child of the king? I don't care where you sit me. I don't care how you walk past me. If you saw the hell I came from, baby, this stuff ain't nothing. You think you're going to roll your eyes at me and run me out of the church? You don't know what kind of man I am. I can take a licking and keep on ticking because I know who I am. I know what God has done in my life. I know where God brought me from. Somebody who understands the words that are coming out of my mouth, give him 30 seconds of crazy praise. I mean crazy praise. I mean crazy praise. I mean ridiculous praise. I mean a radical praise. I mean a revolutionary praise. I mean a praise out of the depths of your belly. I want you to look back out of your shoulder and see where God brought you from and open your mouth and praise him like a madman. Because you know if it wasn't for God, you'd still be in jail. If it wasn't for God, you'd have died with an overdose. If it wasn't for God, you would have blew your brains out. I want to talk to the people who tried suicide, wanted to get out of this world, and God snatched you out. To God be the glory for the things he has done. I feel something about to break loose in this place. This is not a saint's praise. This is a snatch praise. This is for somebody that has been snatched. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor on the right and the left, he snatched me. He snatched me.
I don't have time for no church foolishness. He slaps me. It was an emergency. It was a crisis. It was a generational curse. But God snatched me. He brought me from a mighty long way. He brought me up out of the pits. A day in his courts is better than a thousand years anywhere else. I'd rather be a doorkeeper and stand at the threshold of the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. I'll do anything. I'm glad to be a child of the king. I'm glad to be a child of God. Has God not snatched Joshua out? He might not have survived the tyranny of the heathens that surrounded him. If God hadn't snatched him out, he would have died like his daddy died. If God hadn't snatched you out, you'd be somewhere eating cotton, lost your mind, laying in the gutter, laying on the floor. You couldn't get out gradually. He had to snatch you out. Turn around and tell your neighbor, he snatched me. It was radical. It wasn't cute. It wasn't soft. It wasn't gentle. He snatched me. He snatched me to my senses. He snatched me to my right mind. He snatched me till I got myself together. I feel a praise about to break loose in this place. I feel a breakthrough about to break loose in this place. He snatched me out. Touch seven people and tell them he snatched me. When you hit the eighth one, give God a 30-second crazy prayer. He snatched me. He snatched me out of my sin. He snatched me out of the bed. He snatched me out of the hotel room. He snatched me out of the whole house. He snatched me out of the streets. He snatched me out of jumping from bed to bed. Woman to woman, man to man, I've been snatched. And I tell every devil in hell, I'm not going back to where I came from. I dare you to praise him like you know who he is. Praise him in the balcony. Praise him on the back row. Praise him in the choir stand. Praise him in the pulpit. Everybody who's ever been snatched, open your mouth. Stop being incognito. Stop trying to be cute. Stop trying to be impressive. But open your mouth and give your God a praise. Thank you for snatching me. Thank you for pulling on me. Thank you for your conviction. Thank you for how you challenge me. Thank you for cleaning me up. Thank you for setting me free. neighbor and tell him he's getting ready to snatch you again. You got out of the environment. But you need to change your clothes. You got out of the situation, but Joshua needed to change his raiment. The Bible said, my cut from Zion, Honey, I feel like preaching. The anointing of God is in this place. The Bible said, hallelujah. Joshua had made it into the presence of God, snatched out of Babylon, snatched out of the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, but he was still dressed in filthy raiment. The Bible teaches us in the original Hebrew uh, that he was covered with dung. Uh, 
He didn't look good. He didn't smell good. All of the senses around him testified to the fact that he was a wretch undone, and still he stood in the presence of God, stinky like he was, dirty like he was, messed up like he was, but he made it to the presence of God. Somebody holler, I made it! I might not be quite right, but I made it! I might have some work to do, but I made it! I might have some problems to solve, but I made it! Now, dung covered Joshua is standing in the presence of God, and it almost looks like a trial because, on one hand, the angel is the defense attorney, on the other hand, Satan is the prosecuting attorney, and God Himself is the judge. The defendant is covered with filth. He smells bad. He doesn't look good, but he's standing in the presence of God, and Satan is accusing him because Satan is the accuser of the brethren. My God, woo, I feel like preaching up in here. Have you ever had hell accuse you? Get up in your face, bring up your mess, point out your weaknesses, show you your indiscrepancies, show you your insufficiencies. Satan was an accuser of the brethren. And the Bible said it was not Joshua that rebuked the accuser, but God himself rebuked the accuser. I feel like giving him a praise, because when hell had me dead to rights, the Lord fought my battle for me. Is there anybody in here that God spoke up for you in the middle of your mess? And if it had not been for the Lord that was on your side, you would have been swallowed up. That's why you can't be cute. That's why you run the aisles. That's why you leap the pews. Because God stood up for you with your stinky self, with your smelly self, with your wretched self. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see through many dangers, toils and snares. I have already come. Twas grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me on. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? Can I buy me a witness? Can I borrow a witness? Somebody loan me a witness. Somebody give God a praise. Didn't he do it? Didn't he stick up for you? Didn't he do it? Didn't he make a way for you? Didn't he do it? Didn't he snatch you out? Didn't he do it? Didn't he defend you? Didn't he do it? Didn't he help you out? Shout yeah! Like you really mean it's hot So here Joshua is, standing before the righteous judge, the prosecuting attorney is standing off to the side. The defense attorney is standing off to the other side. But where is his defense? What Satan is accusing him of, he is guilty of. He is wearing his shame. He is carrying his guilt. 
We can see it. We can smell it. And yet the defense spoke up and said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Is not this a brand that I snatched? Is not this a brand that I snatched? Do you know you're a brand that God snatched? Somebody throw your hands up and holler, he snatched me. I may be dirty, but he snatched me. I may be stinking, but he snatched me. I may be weak, but he snatched me. I may be broke, but he snatched me. My credit might be white, but he snatched me. My temperament might be wrong, but he snatched me. This is justification. Handling you just as if you didn't stink. This is justification. Guilty. Romans 7, 7. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Come here, Demarcus. Come here. Put your hands on my shoulder. In Rome, when you killed a man, they would tie the corpse to you so that everywhere you went, the corpse had to go with you. So that as the body was decomposing, the infection that was on the corpse would penetrate into the murderer. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I can't shake it. I can't get it off me. But thanks be unto God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Get off of me. <laughs> Somebody shake yourself and say, get off of me. Get off of me. <laughs> who walk no longer after the flesh, but after the spirit. That is justification. But watch this. And this is where I'm going to close. Here comes sanctification. The accuser has been rebuked. The case has been dismissed. The judge has thrown it out of court. But still there is a requirement. The judge says, Take off your filthy garments. I, no, no, don't clap, listen. I will not allow you to stay in my presence, smelling like you're smelling. Looking like you're looking. Doing like you're doing. You have to understand, when I snatch you, it wasn't that you were near fire, you were on fire. So get the picture. The brand he snatched was burning when he snatched it. If I'd have left you in there any longer, If I would have left you in there any longer, you would have burned up. I snatched you just in time. But I've been too good to you to let you stand here stinking and smelling and doing your thing. I'm going to give you new raiment. But you're going to take off that smelly garment. I'm going to give you a new cap. 
covering for your head. I'm, I've got one that says holiness unto the Lord. I'm going to make you a real priest. You're going to be a real worshiper because of what you and I know that I did in your life. You ain't going to be no phony praiser praising because you got a cute dance. You're going to praise me the rest of your life because you was on fire when I got you. You was on fire when I snatched you. You should have been a statistic. You should have burned up in the fire. I snatched you out. Now you owe me something. You owe me to do better. You owe me to climb higher. You owe me to get right. You owe me not to fake the funk. I didn't snatch you out for you to be what you was. I snatched you out. Now I got a warrant for you. Take off your old filthy garment. And I'm going to give you a robe of pure white. I'm going to bring about a massive change in your life. Snatched. S-N-A-T-C-H-E-D. Eight letters. Snatch me. Snatch me this morning. Don't just encourage me, snatch me. Eight simple letters, snatched. Snatch literally means to take something or someone away by force. In this case, eight letters represents a new beginning. It is like the eighth day in the creation. It is like the eight souls that were saved in Noah's Ark. It is like David being the eighth son of Jesse and he becomes the king. It is like the eighth note on an octave. It is like the eighth day starts a new week. It is like the eighth day when Jesus was circumcised. It is all eight days. It is like the eight days when Thomas comes into the temple and sees Jesus after he had been there eight days ago. It is like Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Finally, brethren. Somebody say, finally, brethren. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report. Number seven, if there be any virtue. And if, number eight, if there be any praise, think on these things. Snatch is like Genesis 8:22. While the earth remaineth, number one, it'll be seed time. Number two, it'll be harvest. Number three, it'll be coal. Number four, it will be heat. Number five, it will be summer. Number six, it will be winter. Number seven, it will be day. Number eight, it will be night, and it shall not cease. Snatched says, I am ready for change. I am ready. I am ready for change.